Thank you. It won't become better, so I leave already. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kate, for being here. Mamma mia. <laughs> Isn't this great? This is super. Yeah, super, yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to stay, share my vision my story. Is that okay? What is our responsibility? What is the role of business in society? Not all, but many of you work for businesses. What are you doing here? What are you doing in your company? How to address malnutrition, how to address climate change. What is our role and responsibility in that field? I am Feike Sibisma. I was welcomed in a very pleasant way by you. But I'm also often very uncertain. But I'm determined. I'm very often searching for the right direction, but with courage. Royal DSM, the company I have the privilege to lead, has 10 billion sales, 250 locations worldwide in five continents, 25,000 people. We're the biggest in the world in nutrition and food ingredients and in sustainable materials, addressing climate change, addressing new forms of energies. Our company is what we call purpose-led and performance-driven, determined to create brighter lives for all. Is that easy? No, it isn't. Over 10 years ago, I became CEO of the company. And people said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to have the company being run successfully and improve the state of the world. Oh, gosh, one of those. Oh, oh. wrong choice as a CEO. <laughs> I said, no, really? Yeah, but what do you want to do? Making money or improving the world? Both, I said, with uncertainty but determined. Once again, the same question. And once again, I said both. And some of my investors said, good. That means improving the world, we can forget your stock. <laughs> now, more than 10 years later, we have shown in our company, we tripled our share price almost. We increased our performance of the company. We have shown to the world that those two things can go together. And I tell to those same people who say, okay, okay, you get some credits, those two things can go together. And I say to those investors, you know what? In 10 years from now, if you still invite me, in 10 years from now, those two things have to go, will go, must go together. You cannot run a company in 10 years from now, forgetting sustainability, forgetting purpose, not contributing to a better world. The millennials will not work for your company. The millennials will not buy your products. So where 10 years ago it was either or, today it is, yeah, they can go together in 10 years from now, and we are on this journey, I think those two things will go together. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, almost 12 years, by the way, I was for the first time in the World Economic Forum in Davos. One of my first times. And I was in a session that had a big impact on me was with an African president, a lady, I won't 
reveal the name of the country. I don't want to harm her. There's a private session. This World Economic Forum Davos, all the important people of the world, shaping the world except the young people not being there, whose world it is. But okay, those sessions. And this lady said to the group, you guys of the West, all your white faces. And I said, this is my first time. I don't know Davos rules yet. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. You give food help, right? To help us in Africa, right? And several of the people around the room say, yeah, we do that. Hmm. And we come with the camera team showing the responsibility of the richer countries. Sure, but your food help is only carbohydrates and only calories. You keep my people alive who were at least dying in the past. I was listening. Did she really say that? President of a country? Said, well, it's a little bit rude, but uh, it's clear. You keep my people alive, but ill. And I'm a poor country. And if you keep my people alive in an ill matter, in an ill way, my country becomes more poor every single day. And you call that help? <laughs> White faces. <laughs> so I thought, uh, I need to come more often to Davos. This is interesting. <laughs> um, so afterwards, I went to her and I said, can I introduce? My name is Faika Siva. And who are you? What are you doing? said, well, we are the biggest micronutrition, vitamins, mineral manufacturer in the world to make food more enriched, uh, that it's not only carbohydrate rich, but also full nutritious, that people don't not only become ill, but also stay alive, but also healthy. <laughs> That's what we are doing as a company. <laughs> so you're one of those evils also then? I said, no, but... I, I, I didn't realize exactly how food help works in the world, but I, I said, you know what? I will approach the UN, we will change this. And she was looking to me, sure. <laughs> I never saw her back again. <laughs> but I went to the UN because I am uncertain, but also determined. And fire, 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 I came to the person we honored earlier this week, late Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan. And I had discussion with him and the head of the World Food Program. At that moment, to switch over to Yuzat Shirin. I said, this is impossible. Is the food help of the world, calories, carbohydrates, keeping people alive, but in an ill way, is that what we are doing? Yeah, but it is emergency. Is it emergency if we support refugee camps for so many years where people are born and dying? Is that emergency help? That is their life. It can't be. My goal is to help at least one million people and to change this narrative and to change this approach of the United Nations World Food Program. People said in my company, I wish you all the best. To change the UN system is impossible. More than 10 years later, we help, as a company, every single day, via the World Food Program, the enrichment of the food of 30 million people around the world. That means of every DSM employee, we have 25,000 employees globally, every employee supports, sometimes unconsciously, more than 1,000 other people's life. In those trips, in that work with United Nations, I had the privilege to travel. And one story I want to share with you in one of those travels, this meeting with this president changed our company and my life. But one of those trips changed also my life. I realized that we have 800 million people suffering from hunger every single day. There are 800 million people, the number is increasing right now, who do not know whether they or their children will be alive next week, in some cases next day. Can you imagine you live your life that you not know whether your children will live in two days from now? 
There are 800 million people living like that in the world, and the number is again increasing. In one of those trips, I was in Bangladesh. At the moment that the world was in a financial crisis, the world reduced its budget to the United Nations, with one or two billion on the World Food Program, because we are in a financial crisis. We cannot spend all that money. We need 1,500 billion to save the banks only in Europe. So we need to reduce one or two million billion to the UN. It is our life, it's our world in which we live. It happened. And the UN took me to a village in the south of Bangladesh where we cut as the international community and food help. It made a strange impression in me that you can fly to an area where you see people more or less dying. You see it on television, but it's not the video. It's real. It's somewhere there. I met with the people, explained what we do, and at a certain moment I was discussing with a woman who had a child in her arms. And at a certain moment, she, before I knew, she handed over the child to me. I was standing with her, and, <laughs> and I had her child in my arms. And I said to the person of the UN, I, I mean, I, what, 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 what's happening here? <laughs> and the lady said, take it. In Bangladesh, the UN translated. I said, what? Take it. I said, I said this, this doesn't work. It, it can't be. I mean, what, what? Take it. And she was crying. And I said to the person of the UN, uh, ask her wh wh why. And she said, the lady said, you know. I said, what do I know? She only repeats, you know. I said, what do I know? And after three, four times exchanging that sentence, she said, you know that if you come back in two years from now, she will not have six children anymore. She knows it, you know it. Take her youngest child. Take her right now. I was standing there. She was crying. And I had not dry eyes either. And all kinds of thoughts went to my mind. I come back on what happened. But I realized also there are many people in the world who suffer from climate change and suffer from poverty right now. We talk about climate mitigation. We talk about preventing climate change. If you live in the south of Bangladesh, you talk about climate adaptation. I'm suffering from climate change right now with the flooding. I visited refugee camps in Somalia where droughts are there, suffering from climate change right now. 120 million people, Horn of Africa, who basically say we need to move out. We cannot live here. We cannot grow our crops. But we cannot move 100 million people to another place in the world anymore. We did it thousands of years ago when we're moving around the globe. It's impossible to do that nowadays. Those people suffer from climate change right now. And you cannot say you cannot say that they caused the climate change. We cannot solve this alone. We cannot do this as a few companies. And therefore, I started a couple of years ago to mobilize other people, to mobilize other companies. In a session in Davos like this, well, not like this, more sober session, I said at a certain moment, can you join our initiative with the World Food Program? And just before, and maybe if we have 100 companies, it would be nine, and nice. And just before I went on stage, I thought 100. I will just say 99. It's nicer. It's marketing. <laughs> and I said, I need 99 companies to help me. And I explained what we're doing. Nobody asked them what we explained we're doing. No questions. The only question, why 99? 
And I didn't thought about it, and I could not say this marketing, that I could not say that. <laughs> so I said, yeah, why 99 buying time? Um, <laughs> that's a good question, that's a good question. You know, why 99? Because you, sir, don't want to be number 100. I said, oh, ooh, we need to rush. I said, yes, and we are with 500 companies now to help us. Because nobody in our global village can be successful in a world that fails. If you are successful, if you are healthy, but your family members not, you will not say that you are happy. If you as a company are successful, but the world around fails you, you cannot be successful in the long term. Or in my narrative, if the world around fails you, you cannot even call yourself successful. So therefore, I often say, you cannot be successful, nor even don't dare to call yourself successful if you live in a world that fails. The economy was never invented to make money. The economy was invented as a distribution model of competences. You catch the buffaloes, I grow the crops, we exchange. A third and a fourth guy came into the picture, we invented gold, then we put gold away, we put it on the bank, we invented money, and later on, we put the money, I don't know, the money is not even there, we write it down in a computer and we all trust it. And we think that making money is the goal. Making money is not the goal. Living here, healthy together, that is the goal. So therefore, we need to work on people, planet, profit. We need to create value as companies on multiple dimensions at the same moment. To work for sh shareholders, no. To work for all the stakeholders. To work on CSR, no to embed it in your mainstream activities, in your mainstream competences, in our company, nutrition and climate change, because that is where our competences are. So I'm standing there. with this baby in my arms. <laughs> and one thing never get got out of my system is the simple words he spoke, two words, he knows, you know. That didn't got out of my system over the last years. So effective and so simple, you know why I hand over with tears in my eyes my youngest child to you, you know. And I thought, <laughs> You know what? I do know. I do know you don't want to hand over because you're crying yourself. But I do know, you know, and then I know, you will not have six children in two years from now. This can't be. Everything went to my head. He's right, I need to take the baby. How do, and, and, and everything was working. Like, I come to the airport, I have no passport, yeah, I have a baby, and uh, can I? <laughs> take it and maybe KLM will say, oh, that's fine, uh, and uh, <laughs> then I come home and yeah, it's a very business trip, uh, things happen. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, how, how does this work? How does this work? I thought this, 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 this doesn't work. So I, I was standing there and I said to the person of the UN, listen, I need to give it back to her. She need, and she was like this. I need to, can you ask her to open her arms? And I will try to open my arms to help her. And the only thing I can do is hand over the baby, but think further how we can change our food help. I handed over the baby back again. And what is still bothering me I don't know what happened with that family and that little girl further. I just don't know. I don't know whether she's still alive or not. I know if you look to the statistics and the numbers, that many are not alive anymore. 
And that brought me in with the UN and the World Food Program to the discussion, how long are we going to continue? It's great that we help 30 million people, but how long are we going to continue with this? And they said, for a long time. I said, cannot be. And we started an initiative, Africa Improved Foods. We started the initiative of Africa Improved Foods to make Africa, to make India self-sufficient. We invited more than 10,000, now 20,000 farmers in Africa, in Rwanda. Yeah. And I said to the farmers, everything you can grow in the coming five years, I buy it, 100%. And I built a big factory in Kigali, and I process all your corn and your soy in a big factory in Kigali for the local population. Locally sourced, locally manufactured for the local population. This is the way... This is the way we make Africa, we make India self-sufficient. Now we start with fortified rice in India. I will tell you not all those different stories, because I see them running over time. That is a message to backstage, because they become nervous. But this is the way to make Africa uh, self-supporting, and not to continue, maybe with this noble food help forever. Which world do you want to leave behind? Which is the world that I want to leave behind? Which is the world that my boys want to leave behind? This is a picture we took when I took my two boys and my wife to Swaziland. I don't know whether there's anybody from Swaziland here. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. As you know, many, many people suffering from AIDS. Many poor people in Swaziland. I took my boys, my wife, and we were explaining what we were doing and helping them. And at a certain moment, I was hugged by several of those people. This is one of the young boys. And stupidly, I said to the teacher of the school we were visiting, they like us, right? Yeah because of the food help and what we do? Mm, maybe. Is it not? I don't think so, sir. But they, you see what they do, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I missed the point because, sir, there are many people suffering from AIDS here. Yeah, I know. Look around, you have 100 children at this school. 60 are orphans. The guy who is hugging you is an orphan. He's never being hugged. Never. He has a hard life here amongst his peers. And the way apparently you approach them, he felt the liberty to hug you. And he just loves to be hugged. And that's the only thing he wants. I thought. Yes. So if we think about your career and your future, don't think about doing the next things right. Doing, thinking about the next right things. I would say, follow your passion. It is possible, you've seen what we try to do. With your help and your passion, we can do it. I close by saying, dare to focus on the challenges of the world. I close by saying, dare to focus on the long term. I close by saying, dare to lift your own anchors of certainty. I close by saying, dare to mobilize the moral courage to make this world together a better place. And I do that. Being uncertain, but determined. And I do that searching for the right directions, but with courage, with you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Faker, and thank you uh, for also joining our advisory board. You can see why we wanted this troublemaker on the advisory board. Give him a huge hand. Thank you very much.